do that to Don. Don't I do love that. Don. I, I hope the world knows that. Yeah. I love him. Oh, no, we get that. I'm not torturing him. He's very I, human. I, mean, I want him to find happiness. Had a scotch and a cigarette. It's so cool. <laughs> um, <clears throat> thank you for. Uh, it's called. Uh, I'm a professional. Yes, that's right. <laughs> uh, I wore my, my T-shirt for uh, for Mad Men that I wear under this for. I'm sorry, my undershirt. Um, I uh, I'm very honored to do this. Uh, I'm, thank you. I'm so I'm thrilled. I'm a tremendous big, uh, fan. Uh, me too. You I, know, I've watched you know the that. show since the very very beginning, and uh, God, I feel um I feel like Peggy. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, I, 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 I don't want to let you down, and I want to hold my own, <laughs> and I'm a little nervous. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so we, we had talked about, because uh, the show has been such a success and a cultural phenomenon for so many years now that he's talked to death about it. So I asked him last week, you know, what don't you want to talk about, and what can we talk about that, we, that you haven't had a chance to? And what Matt said was really the writing, you know, the writing of the show. And uh, I, so I have a bunch of questions. Um, you write a pilot, you have this idea. You don't know how long it's gonna be picked up. You don't know how many seasons you're gonna have. So how much of the story did you have in mind and did you have an ending at the time? For the whole thing? Yeah. Well, you know, it's one step at a time. And I wrote the pilot and it's now well known that it was, you know, four and a half years, I think before, or five years. It got me the job on The Sopranos in about two and a half years. Yeah. And then about three and a half years later, uh, AMC uh, was interested in it, and, and so I had to sort of say what the rest of the story was. But, you know, I had worked on a lot of pilots, and I thought, well, it was a good premise, and it was, a, it, it was definitely wound up for some kind of story. And interestingly, there's seven years between writing the pilot and writing the second episode. Wow. Yeah. And during that seven years, I happened to spend four and a half of them on The Sopranos. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which is, you know... If, you know, it's, it's Harvard. How did you, know? you I played for the Yankees. You, what did you take from that? Uh, the show's very different than it would have been. There was also a lot of stuff that happened in between. Um, good Night and Good Luck happened. The West Wing happened. Uh, um, uh, Far From Heaven, the Todd Haynes movie. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was a lot of stuff that kind of informed what I did or didn't want to do. And I just became more confident in the idea that I was going to really try to recreate something without any abstraction that would, that would not have any distance from the audience, mm -hmm. that you would be able to place yourself in it. It's part of why I was happy that AMC didn't have enough money to cast big stars, that I could get uh, working actors that were great that you would think were those people. And I had in mind how the whole thing would end, but I didn't really know what the second episode was when I wrote the pilot. I just thought, this is a good setup for something. Mm. And when AMC was interested in it, we had a meeting uh, where I actually behaved rather uncharacteristically in the sense that they said, well, what's the rest of the show like? And instead of just bullshitting and like, you know, saying what I, you know, I wanted it so badly, no one wanted this thing. That's also well known. I mean, nobody. And even AMC was, was brought up because my manager's assistant said, oh, they're looking for a show. And everyone's like, who are they? What are they? American right. movie yeah, classics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and they actually had a negative image because they had been an all-movie channel and then had changed into a commercial-supported all-movie channel Which, yeah, and had pan and scan and everybody who used to love it. Imagine if Turner Classic Movies suddenly put, cut up the movies and put in commercials. You would, like, hate them. Yep. So, um, <laughs> so uh, but they were completely interested in taking a risk. And Christina Wayne, who was in charge there, gave me Revolutionary Road and said, I was trying to make, make this into a series. Have you read this? I hadn't read it. I read it. I was like, oh, my God. You know, this is, a, you know, I'm glad I didn't know this existed. I would have never written this pilot. <laughs> um, although it's a very internal story. Um, and I wanted it to be external. Although there are a lot of rules about storytelling that I kind of didn't believe in. Like what? Like that you can't tell an internal story, that that's only for novels. Uh, that, you know, I knew that you could dramatize internal states. I knew that you could recreate a psychological state. And I knew, even though I didn't really have a genre, which is one of the things I love about your work, you've worked in so many different genres and, and, and kind of defined them in a weird way, but I don't see you as a genre writer. So 
for me, you know, once the genre is there to help you engage the audience, you know, you can do an amazing version. The Sopranos is a mob story, but it, it, what a mob story, right? And it's so different, and he's seeing a psychiatrist, and he has no power over his children, and there's just so many, and there's mini malls, and like, you know, Italianissimo, and New Jersey, and all these things that no one had seen before. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> seriously. Although many of us have lived. Yeah. I mean... I remember thinking about that, like when I was watching the show, like the art director had like gone and found ugly shit, like people didn't do that. Oh. We had plastic on our furniture. <laughs> when we up. It was... Yeah, I had it too. <laughs> we, you know, working in New Jersey, it was one of these things, you know, Brooklyn. You're, you're Italian, yeah. and I'm Jewish, and you go to a neighborhood in New Jersey on a scout, and you'd walk in, and it was the, all the furniture was the same. There's the plastic, Time there's stopped. the white couch, the lucite frames, <laughs> and then you'd look over at the frame, and you'd say, okay, is that a picture of the Pope or a picture of a guy at the Wailing Wall? Because it's the same house. <laughs> it's the same house. The, the Italian houses smelled better, that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> um, for food reasons. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm not a, I'm not a self-hating, I'm not, I know my audience. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I said, let me think about it. And I went back and sort of thought about it. And I went back to look for my notes. Couldn't find shit. Found this script that I'd abandoned on page 80 that I'd worked on right up until I got a job in TV called The Horseshoe. And as I was looking through it, I saw the last page in the script said, Ossining, 1960. And it was five years between abandoning that script because I got a job on a TV show mm. and writing Mad Men because I had a job on a TV show and I wasn't happy. Huh. And I was like, that's who this guy is. This is the story of that guy. Huh. And so I went back and I gave all the bullshit that I promised I was gonna give, which was, this is about the 20th century, this is about conformity, I re you know, this is about the lonely crowd, inner directedness versus outer directedness, we're in a conformist society right now, people don't know this, how much it's like it was then. I have a little bit of a jab to the boomers, I apologize again to my audience. But, you know, I'd grown up in the Reagan era and I wanted to talk about what it was, you know, they did not invent sex, they did not invent drugs, they did not invent any of this. Yeah. As soon as you start digging a little bit deep in the research, you start to see all of your suspicions confirmed about the beatniks and about, you know, I always said like the, the greatest example of what the thesis of the show was is that there was a character on network TV, Maynard G. Krebs, who was a beatnik. And that if network TV thinks that the audience knows what this outsider, <laughs> what this hipster is, then, then the 60s have started way before people think they did. Mm -hmm. And I think that shows like 1960. Mm -hmm. um, what's it called? Uh, Dobie Gillis. Dobie Gillis. Thank you. Which is still holds up, by the way. It's very funny. <laughs> so, so I knew what, what would, how far I wanted to go, but it was one episode at a time. And so I was you, just begging them for a second episode. I didn't know how it would happen. I knew I wanted to do the decade. I didn't know if it would be five years. I didn't know if they were going to give me six episodes. I didn't know what they were going to do, but that was what I told them. And this is the story. Every episode... I'm not gonna have a formula. I'm gonna try and give you some kind of holy shit. Mm. And that was thrown back in my face all the time. They would get the episode and they're like, what's the holy shit in this one? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I remember episode three, I'm like, Don didn't go get the birthday cake. <laughs> <laughs> By the rules of television, holy people are gonna shit. say holy shit. <laughs> That's the worst dad ever. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, that episode in particular, the people at the network, um, one of them, Rob Sorcher, had kids. Christina Wayne did not have kids. And Rob Sorcher, they had a little argument in front of me where Rob Sorcher's like, that is really screwed up. <laughs> Trust me, there is no man on TV who's ever been sent out to get a birthday cake and not come home. Back <laughs> <laughs> but everybody's wanted to. <laughs> no one wants to go back to that birthday party. So, um, and, I, and you know, I had all this stuff when we finally got to the second episode and it was about Betty and there were, there's no peed in it and they're mm -hmm. like, where's the product? What's he selling this week? I thought he was gonna go up against it every week and I was like, oh. I don't wanna have a formula. That's episodic, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. right, you know, the episodic television rule, yeah. which we can say out loud here, yeah. I don't care if it embarrasses certain people because yeah. they really believe in it. Yeah. Nobody grows, nobody learns anything. <laughs> it ensures syndication because you can watch it and months, 
years later and the episodes stand by themselves. But I, I don't agree with it anymore, especially because now we binge watch a lot of things. Well, I was arguing with them about The yeah, Sopranos. It doesn't make any, any sense. And I binge Even watched be some series that um, uh, I stopped watching them. I lose interest because I realized by the second season the, the characters are having exactly the same problems they had the first season because they can't come up with more story because they're restricted. And it was derived from a model which was this simple. When I was working in sitcom, Friends was the biggest thing on the planet, followed by Seinfeld. Followed, believe it or not. Seinfeld b b did emerge as probably the classic of its era. And it took a while. And to took there. a long while. Yeah. And Friends is, you know, we're going to be watching it forever. I still turn it on once in a while. I know, I, I know where they are. And uh, <laughs> I, 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 it's very well cast. And it's very funny. Yeah. Um, and I love their apartments. But um, there is a thing where they would say to you on network TV, like, the most loyal viewer of the show only watches six episodes out of 22 a year. So we can't have a story arc. Mm -hmm. We can't have anything that they're going to turn in and not know what happened. If they get married, it's got to be in the finale, so they got a summer to catch up or something like yeah. that. You can't push it. Even though these are the same people who used to suddenly add a child to the story, remember? <laughs> when the sitcom gets old and all of a yes. sudden you come back the next year and they're There's like, a kid. Where, where's the baby? And now the baby's six. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't want to do that. Yeah. So that's what I knew at the beginning was that I wanted to do something different. And then people start asking you questions yeah. and you start having a philosophy about how to answer them. And, and you know, I keep saying, I, 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 I. It was just me for a while. Then when the director comes on, then we start getting, I bring the crew from The Sopranos, almost everybody. Really? Yeah, the director was from The Sopranos too, Alan Taylor. And uh, Phil, Phil Abraham, who's now a big director on the show and directs everywhere else, he was the cinematographer on The Sopranos. Bob Shaw was the production designer on The Sopranos. I took everybody that production I could stand. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, oh. I did. There was a little payback. <laughs> there were some people who weren't so nice to me and all of a sudden they couldn't be on my, sh <laughs> my shitty pilot for AMC. Um, and there was also a little bit of a crisis, which I thought was good in a way because it meant that there was something in the air. But Across the Universe, the Julie Taymor mm -hmm. film, and Revolutionary Road were shooting at the same time. And that you were doing so, the pilot? That we were doing the pilot, wow. so we couldn't get any 60s clothes. Oh. We could, but our extras only got the leavings because we were the least well-budgeted. <laughs> Julie Taymor's thing was a little later, but we have very, very, very small extras. Yeah, you know, you know, short. There were the only suits that were left. <laughs> John Hamm is a giant because most, there's not a guy over five two in that show. In that period, <laughs> <laughs> in the office, anywhere. I'm not kidding. I always <laughs> thought, um, and by rewatching them again, that you kind of reinvented the epi the episodic uh, structure in a way because in each episode, it's almost like an individual short story because in every episode, there's also this um, this underlying. Uh, identifiable thematic idea that's individual to each to each one that's the, we're trying to do that it's how do you do that is what i'm asking <laughs> you I, if you could just um, take me through a writer's room you, you come up how does it go from well first idea of all to that? you can put any three stories together and if you've had a, an english degree or anything like that you can make them seem like they're related to each other yeah and you got to be careful because you're no, like well it's never not be careful it's not on, everybody it's on the nose it's always well really subtle I find that when we put the stories together, first of all, the writer's room does that. And so stories sort of go together and you sort of think these are sort of related to each other. I don't even know why. And then uh, my wife is often essential in this. It's something sometimes that happens later in a draft. Mm -hmm. And what really, the, your chance to hit the theme, if you believe in this, I never start with a theme. It's no. literally something that emerges. And I hate exposition. So it's a chance in the exposition to sort of illuminate the theme. It's a chance to sort of like, I'll give you the best example. The, the, one of the toughest scripts that we had to write, and it was really a bitch. It was, a, it was to the point where when, when I finished the draft, I leaned out the window and screamed, I beat you. <laughs> <laughs> I was channeling uh, Gina Rollins and Gloria. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm so masculine. Um, Jenna Rollins. So... We couldn't figure out what held it together. I knew I wanted to do this show um, that, that had this twist in it that was about pulling the plug on, on an event, that having the things going in one direction and then just like kind Wait, of falling apart. The, this is the lawnmower. The lawnmower. Oh, I didn't even say. <laughs> I didn't even say. <laughs> it doesn't matter which one it is. <laughs> no. And there was so much extra story. There was a romance for Peggy. There was all this crap that fell out of it. And we really were having a tough time. And all I knew is that I wanted to get this account 
I wanted there to be some competitive aspect to it, and I wanted you to think that this was a pilot, and that here was Don's new tension. This man was gonna come in who was indestructible mm. and amazing, and then you were just gonna pull the plug on it. I, I, it was derived from the fact, I think, I use it as an example, but you know, I, I said to the writers, I was like, what happens if I come in here and I say, well, I just got a call from Vanity Fair, they want to do a profile on you, and I pointed to one of the writers, tomorrow. And they're like, what, really? Yeah, I said, they just want to do it. They want to take a, just an average writer on the thing. You have an interesting story. They want to do it. You're going to go home, go to sleep, stuff like that. You come in tomorrow morning, and I say, you know what? It's not going to happen. What happened to you? Nothing, right? Mm. But that's not what happened. No. So anyway, so we sort of had that idea of like the, the very physical structure of the story changing. Mm -hmm. And Don has been, has been marginalized in some way. They do the org chart. Roger's not even on it. <laughs> um, the whole thing of like, and, and my wife said to me, and, and, and the story that went with it was Sally thinking that Grandpa Jean's ghost was living in the baby. Mm. And so my wife gave me this line, and I always give my wife credit for these things, and it's always a little bit hurtful to my writing staff because she comes in and puts the cherry on the sundae. <laughs> And she is really, really smart, and uh, she does have to live with me. They should be grateful. Um, but she always, she's really smart and really understands story. Sometimes she has her own agenda, which I have to fight. I'm like, I'm not doing that. I know you want to write that. You write that script. <laughs> and I'm so defensive, and I'm awful, and it's horrible. But she has incredible insight, and she said, she puts, writes this line down for Sally when Don's in there at the end, at the beginning, and she wants a nightlight and everything, and she won't tell anybody what she's afraid of. And Don says, what are you afraid of? And she goes, I'm afraid of what will happen when the light goes off. Hmm. And that little crumb, it's just exposition. She ne he never asked what are you afraid of before. He just come in and say, go to bed. Turn off the lights. You're acting weird. Your mom says you're acting weird. Stop acting weird. That's <laughs> very realistic. And Linda giving me that it just changed the whole script. Hmm. And I started going through and finding the places to, to create the anticipation. Right. To create the anticipation of goodness that doesn't really exist. Hmm. And in fact, one of the sort of quotable lines of the thing is, is, you know, Joan is having her last day at work and finds out that her husband has no brains in his fingers and that he's not gonna be a surgeon, and she's there in the hospital with him, and she says, you know, one day you're on top of the world, the next day some secretary's running over your foot with a lawnmower. Mm -hmm. That was a direct, that line wasn't in the first draft. That was mm -hmm. a direct result of understanding what the theme was. And it's all over the thing. It's yeah. all over the show, and you don't wanna hit it too hard, but the great thing about this show, because, it's, because it doesn't have a genre, and because it is on a human scale, is you can write an episode about something so esoteric, and that can be the theme. It can be something like, you know, it's not, a, a theme is not the lies we tell ourselves. A theme to me is something like, when you get caught in a lie, you see all your lies at once, mm. right? Mm. It's just like a cascade of horribleness. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, doing an episode about how you're perceived but literally doing an episode, it's like kind of my favorite episode in a weird way of the show is, is Maiden Form. And it's the one where Don is looking in the mirror at the end and there's this vibrating noise and everything. And I had this experience, you're so sleep deprived, you're having, you ever seen Eight and a Half? That's sort of what it's like, only it's less realistic. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you just sort of, you know, I'm gonna write a story about, in the most literal way, so that this young model comes in and says, you know, Pete meets her and she says, I took a picture, you know, they, they came in and they didn't like me. They, they liked my picture, but they didn't like me in person, which is weird because all they want to do is take a picture of you. Mm. And then he goes home to have sex with this very sexy, exotic model and she lives with her mom, you know? And mm. so she's like, didn't you think I had a mother? <laughs> and you know, Betty Draper meanwhile is, is at the, is seeing her, this guy she's been flirting with at the country club and he comes in to see her and he's hitting on her again and then her kids run up and say, mommy, how are you seen? And of course, Don literally can't look himself in the mirror. Yeah. So that, to like write about something that strange and kind of like, I knew it's one of my favorites because I knew you couldn't do that on any other show. And I don't even know if we did it on ours if we pulled it off but I, or if yeah. people got that. But, and Phil Abraham directed that and there's this incredible, I just remember going in the, in the bathroom at work, which has terrible lighting, 
and it's, a, it's an old office building from the 50s, and, and looking at myself in the mirror and not recognizing myself, mm. and saying, oh, this is what I look like to other people. I'm actually able to see it right now. I'm not looking in my eyes. I get the sense of who I am. And then there was this noise, like a didgeridoo, it was probably a fluorescent light, mm. of just, it was so unpleasant that I was like, you don't wanna see that. Mm. You cannot reconcile that with how you feel from the inside, right? Mm. You know, you wanna do a first person story. How many of us, you know, do you know that you see the bridge of your nose all the time? I mean, at least I do. <laughs> you know, at least Italians and Jews do. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's sort of like something that small and that becomes the theme. And sometimes, you know, you're searching. So you don't start with theme, you start with I character. never what start. What do you start with? We start with story. Um, and so there's stories for each of the episodes, and they're kind of in a way. Coming from character or just over our arbitrary, or stories that you're laying on episodes? I stole this from David Chase, and oh. I assume this is how it's done. David Chase would come in at the beginning of the season with a lot more than I ever came in with. A work, st I, I, I'm, I, I'm gonna out him. I don't give a shit. Okay. Because. <laughs> I think it's nice, I could claim it as my own. So he's a very private person, but I'm gonna, <laughs> I, instead of claiming it as my own, I'm gonna give him credit for it, but it is his thing. And I had never worked on a drama or a one hour show or anything, so I assume everything that I learned was his, and I learned some of it was just the tradition of one hour writing. He'd been working for 30 years. But anyway, so professional story for Tony, personal story for Tony. Okay. Everybody else has an arc for the season. For the season. For the season. This is where it starts, this is where it ends, and it probably has a climax and a couple of beats. Each in character. It. Each character. You, the main oh. characters. Carmela had a story. You know, Betty would have a story. For each season, they had their arc. Their they had their arc, arc and you, that's what you'd do before the writers came. Ah. And you'd sort of get a sense, and that had a theme in a way, but it was usually derived from either where I was in my life, where we left off, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. They're all different. They're all different. They're so different that the audience is, always has this repulsion to the second episode of the season when they realize that it's not the same story from last year. Well, They're you would skip years. You, 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 just, you on that I did on did purpose. That. You did it on purpose. I did it the first season because I realized if I skip years, <clears throat> that I would have some momentum going into it because I thought I'd used everything well, up. Well, as an audience member, that's when, when I hit the second season, I realized, <coughs> I went, oh, this isn't going to be this just time capsule, this one thing. This is going to be an era, an entire period that we're looking at. And that made it more exciting. Oh, that's good. To me. That's great. I mean, you Second know. Second season I loved. Oh, thanks. That before. was terrifying. But you know, in terms of what I started with, I knew I, I was so delusional. I had songs, I had everything. I had a, I had a file on my iPod that was uh, just songs if I ever got to do Mad Men. I had a watch that Don would wear. Don't even ask. <laughs> and I had story <laughs> ideas. And then once they said they were gonna do it, even once we shot the pilot mm. and the trigger was pulled, I had about five months left at The Sopranos where I was alone in New York and I just thought of ideas and I had stories that I always wanted to tell. I wanted to do that story about Israel, mm -hmm. the first season, about, as I said, America's love affair with Israel, um, which was very clear. I wanted to do a story about, uh, about the hobo, which was a, a scene in the, in the screenplay, but I wanted to do a scene, I wanted to do a story about the hobo I had that idea for Roger having a heart attack mm -hmm. and all that dialogue. I would pitch dialogue to myself. I start with dialogue. I don't know if you do. Yeah. I, yeah. So, I, 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 and I learned to like call myself on the phone or write it down and not take it for granted that it was happening. Do you communicate saying, that to the other writers, the dialogue? Do you act it? Do you? Oh, yeah. And I channel it in the room sometimes. Well, this is what I want because it has when I such a unique... Joan, apparently, I always put my hand You did? There. You always did? <laughs> And I would pitch, when I pitch Don, I think I'm sexy. <laughs> and I, when I pitch Pete, they don't even know I'm pitching. Because <laughs> I'm fascinated by how consistent, people don't re realize one of the toughest things about writing is, is a consistent tone, is finding a tone for the story. And this show has the most consistent, unusual tone because it's quiet and it's subtextual and it's minimalist. But it's so consistent in performances and the writing all the way through. And I wondered how you accomplished that when you have a team of writers who are well, all different people. Well, I write a lot of the dialogue. And I even write it and give it to them. And I, everything goes through my computer. The tone that's hard is not that. The tone that's hard is the story tone. And I have found amazing people and they are like-minded, and I actually feel very proud, and it was like this at The Sopranos too, I think, that when, when something, no matter how outrageous or high risk it was, that I was on board.
Because mm. I've worked in so many rooms where someone would think of something amazing and you're like, we're never gonna do that. You know, I was in a writer's room, you know, uh, on, on, a, on a sitcom. I hadn't, wasn't in sitcom yet. And they would talk about the night that the masturbation episode of Seinfeld was on and how they were, how dejected they were and how they're like, well, we're writing this stupid thing now. Instead of like saying like, why don't we try that? Why don't we try something like that? But they, they couldn't and they can't. And uh, it's not all their fault uh -huh. because there's lots of great writers out there who never get to express what they're trying to express and they're trying to catch it. Were your writers from different mediums? Were they all television or other It took me a long time. I, I, I started off with, with most of the writers having one thing in common, which is that they were my friends. <laughs> and by friends, I mean people I'd either worked with or people who I had given the script to early on and had been supportive of me. And I thought had a good sensibility. Maria and Andre, who were on until this last season, they were not fired, they went off to pursue their own projects. Um, they, I knew them, we, Maria and I were in a writer's group together before we ever had a job. Mm. We kept in touch and they read the pilot, called me up, praised me. You know, no one would read this thing, no one. And just having them read it and like, like it and get it made me very happy. And on the phone, I spontaneously said, if I ever get together to go to the show on the air, I will give you a job. And <clears throat> seven years later, I called them up. They had moved to Vancouver. Mm. They were, she was gonna teach at the school. They had decided to change their lives because they had been on a couple shows and it hadn't worked out. And they picked up and came down. Uh, Lisa Albert, uh, eventually Janet Leahy, Tom Palmer, most of the first season were people that I had worked with on this Diane English show, which Tom Palmer ran. You're a majority of female, <coughs> female writers. In, in yeah, I don't, I don't keep track of that. It just, it just happened that way. I don't even know what to tell you, because uh, it's funny, because when I met the publicist from AMC originally, Theanu, she goes, you are such a macho little shit. <laughs> and I was like, I'm macho? <laughs> Was, cool. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> and um, I was raised by a very powerful woman. I don't, can't tell the difference. So I, I, half the writers I love, I don't even care who they are. Mm. I was raised in a very liberal environment. I was raised where feminism was the most exciting idea in college. I just don't, I mean, I've hired, I read blind. Mm -hmm. I hate almost everything, male and female. <laughs> and, and, you know, I hired Davi Waller and Marty Knox, and I thought they were dudes. <laughs> right? Um, you know, not when I met them, but when I read their names. <laughs> and just a good writer. And you know, yeah. it's one of these things that irritates me about the society as a whole. We have this predisposition and as gender becomes more and more complex, not that it hasn't always been complex, but that it's becoming defined in a more complex way, legally, socially, psychologically. I just never paid attention to it. Yeah. And I think you can, you can be a trans whatever and write for an African-American mm -hmm. uh, whatever. You can, you know, I am not only interested in stories uh, with main characters that are George Costanza. You know, I know I look like him. I know I have the same personality. <laughs> but I, I'm interested in other stories, yeah. you know? So the idea that young women like a show that's about young women, there is some truth to that sometimes, especially if it's an ignored segment. And certainly you like to see people that look like you on TV. It's a crime to not have people that look like everyone. But um, I just picked the people I liked. And you know, I can tell you right now that if it, it, sexism is very common, I'm not going to, to act Still? like it's not. Oh, please. You know how many emails I get for, I'm looking for, we're looking for our female writer. As if it's a diverse, like they have. Yeah, to. it is a diversity thing. Oh, sure. We're either gonna have a black person or a female. Maybe we can <laughs> knock them off two at a time. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's so stupid. Oh God. That's what I was saying. It's like you know, not that much has changed in a weird way. Yeah. The way that you know, I always talk about how you define we. You know, when you're in, when you're in a room with a bunch of people. Believe it or not, I grew up in, a, in an environment where a lot of people didn't know I was Jewish. I don't know how, <laughs> but they didn't. And uh, it's probably a point of pride for my parents because they're from that, what I call the nose job generation. They didn't they're want like, yeah, they yeah. Didn't want it, yeah. They, they are, they, my dad is a preppy and he's the mm -hmm. first person in his family to go to college and they, they wanted us, they knew that us going to Ivy League type colleges and going to private schools and things like that besides being educated, which mm -hmm. is very important to Jewish people. I know not to Italians, but. <laughs> 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 there are very few cultures. <laughs> Other than Chinese Americans, where you have the mom's really excited that her kid's a physicist. <laughs> but anyway, so 
you know, be in a conversation in high school and hear people talking about it and then them say something incredibly anti-Semitic or incredibly oh, yeah. racist and you're just sitting there like, mm -hmm. like Sal. I did that scene on the show of Sal sitting there while they're making fun of some gay guy. Mm -hmm. It's the worst feeling in the entire world and, and I, I will tell you right now, I was like Sal, I never said, hey, I'm Jewish. I was like, yeah, yeah that guy. Wow. But the, you know, Sal <laughs> brings up a, a good point. It's one of the it's one of my favorite moments of how your the writing of that show uh, isn't on the nose and it's it's quite visual and cinematic and it's in its uh, character study. Uh, Sal is finally getting the job to direct a commercial and it's based on the Anne Margaret <laughs> opening to Bye Bye Birdie, and he's married to Kitty and he's um, in bed and he's working and Kitty comes in with a real a green kind of mini skirt. Uh, negligee and starts to come on to him and he says I, I have to work and she says oh okay honey and he says well can I show you what I'm doing <laughs> and he gets up and he starts to act out the and Margaret part and the way they shot it is so brilliant because without any dialogue she goes from oh wow my husband's really my husband's really creative this is going to be great my husband's gay and <laughs> it's all in her face and he just do you, you know I really believe in you do you really think so and it's so tragic she hu he hugs her and the expression on her face that we see that he doesn't and it's that kind of storytelling She's that's all okay. the way through the series let's give I some, just adore Well I appreciate that and I, let's give some credit where credit is due First of all, Mike Uppendahl directed that episode. It was one of his first episodes and he killed it. Second of all, that actress is Sarah Drew and she is one of the most wonderful actresses oh. I've ever worked with. I think she's on Grey's Anatomy and I, I, I love her. Mm. Uh, she agreed to cut her hair without telling her agent and I will always thank her for that. <laughs> um, and she, the, uh, I have worked with this man named Bob Levinson who worked at BBDO. He's not, there's two Bob Levinsons. He was a media guy. And he was the only Jew at BBDO at that time. Uh, and he informed a lot of Sal. Yeah. And before he was even a uh, consultant on the show, he was at, in 1960, he called me up. He was the head of television at ICM. Mm. Uh, not in 1960, but when I did the pilot. And he said, you know, in 1960, I was on the Lucky Strike account. Huh. And I want to know how old you are and if you have a time machine. <laughs> and he goes, the only thing you got wrong is our offices were not that nice yet. <laughs> and so I would talk to him about things. And I had this whole plot for Sal that was based on something I'd overheard at The Sopranos about how the, 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 the gangsters ran a, the gay bars. And I had this idea that Sal would go to this gay bar and fall in love with the gangster. The gangster uh, son. Uh, <laughs> no, the gangster who ran it who's not oh. gay. Of course. It was just like sitting there, you know, taking, pouring the drinks. Anything illicit, anything illicit in the, in the, in the village was run by the mafia. That's right, yeah. Um, not that there is a mafia. No. <laughs> and, um, Nor so do I, I know told, Yeah. <laughs> so I told them this, they think just because your name ends in a vowel. I love when David <laughs> Chase wrote that. So anyway, so when I wrote, when I told them this pitch for the thing, he goes, oh, this was the first season before I started writing. He goes, oh, no, no, he'd never do that. I go, what do you mean? Isn't it kind of a great story that he falls in love with the only straight guy in the place? And it's, he goes, no, he'd never go to a gay bar. Yeah. I go, what do you mean? He goes, he, he, he wouldn't do anything. Not at that time. He hasn't done anything. No, he gave me the idea that this guy was a virgin. Oh, he'd never done anything? He had not, not with a man. Uh, and he sits there and he goes, and he's sort of looking down, and he goes, he knows what he wants to do. And I, that was it. I spent the entire season working up to that line when Sal says, I know what I want to do with that guy who has, gives him the opportunity, and yeah. it's in the hobo code, I think. Mm -hmm. And so Bob was like, he's married. He goes, there's plenty of gay people there that are out at that time. They're choreographers, and they're on Broadway, and they're running around in the village. Everybody else is faking it. And if you go to work and you notice another guy's gay, the two of you are both in trouble. You go to a bar, and you see him. That's the whole, we played that with Lee Garner Jr. When mm -hmm. Lee Garner Jr. Mm -hmm. comes on to him, Sal is in more trouble for or the not fact, going with him. Right, and for the fact that Lee knows that yeah. he's gay. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Lee can do whatever he wants. That's right. So this whole dynamic of him being a virgin and everything was just like fascinating to me and, and fresh, and I knew it was real. Yeah. Bob was married and had three children, and he was on the Lucky Strike account in 1960. Amazing. So he told me that this guy is married, and I said, well, she's got to know, and he goes, she doesn't know. Mm. And so we had this idea, this is where the story, where the writer part of me comes in. He tells me the story about like, you know, he, Bob is from the, you would, Bob has no, he is so closeted from working in, in, in the world where he had to be closeted. 
uh, now he's gay, he's married, he's got this great life, and he came out, you know, and lost like a bunch of weight and all this other stuff <laughs> when he did. And he's a great dad and a grandfather and everything, but the idea was, how would she find out? Mm. And he, his first t attack on it, he goes, when she finds out that he's directing this Bye Bye Birdie thing, she's going to know. I'm like, no, she's not. And so we decided it could, <laughs> that, he, that if he could act it out, and he, his musical theater, I know it's a cliche. No, but once the shoulders start to move, then... The whole yeah. thing, and you know, Brian Batt oh. is a Broadway star. Yeah. And uh, you, this is not, you know, acting on Mad Men was a day job for him. This, there's very few people. Robert Morrison and he both, yeah. you see them sing and you're like, wow, there's like 20 people in the world Thank that Thank you for that. letting Robert Morris sing at the end. Oh, that was like, such welcome. a great, uh, right? <laughs> oh, God. But that was a very long way. Thank you. I mean, he, I can't believe I know him. <laughs> uh, that was a very long way of basically saying like, that was derived from his real life. Got it, from that, like, that you moment. Like, they get clues, and Bob, had, yeah. Bob was married to his high school sweetheart. Yeah. So they knew each other forever. But there was just like, you know, what can you do to push it? How would they find out, you know? Yeah. And they'd stay married. And in, in the casting, because... Uh, and it's silent. It, it's silent. That's it, the that's best That's what part. I loved the best. It was no dialogue. It was yeah. all in her face. That's and you had to favorite. interact. You had to You got to have a great actor. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's what you raise the level of the audience's interaction because we have to interpret. You know, I can't you stand have to pay people. Attention. Yeah, and I can't stand people. That I, I, I've sometimes watched it with guests who have stayed over and, and they watch it and they go, well, nothing happened. And I can't stand <laughs> that. I, I, actually, I actually played a joke. I, I actually turned to one of them and said, oh, did you miss the episode where Christine uh, uh, killed the zombie who worked for Lucky Strike? <laughs> and they went, what season was, was that? Um, uh, it drives me crazy because there's so much going on, all, all in subtext. The plot is, and the subtext thing, that's oh, the Sopranos. Just, but it, I always liked subtext, and David was like, live with it's it. It's an art to write it, though, because you, you write this way and not, not dead on. I don't know how else to put it, but it's... it's um, I think cause, people just don't say what they're thinking. And it's very cinematic, I mean, because you're, you're counting on how you're shooting the, ac the actor and what you're juxtaposing it between, you know, scenes. Yeah. Um, you try and do that on paper, but you, you need great directors. Exactly. Need, yeah. And in casting, because the uh, TV is a living, breathing thing, as you're working on it, it starts to, even film to a certain extent in the edit room, it starts to tell you what it is, and you have to start to serve it and not fight it. And I was wondering, when you cast uh, these actors, uh, because I can't imagine any other actors playing these parts, um, for instance, for example, C Christina Hendricks and Joan, how that part got either evolved or changed or grew because she was playing it. Uh, that it evolved so much that that was not a series regular. It wasn't originally. No, that was just like, we gotta have, you know, I imagined uh, that, you know, Eve Arden or somebody was in the office and they were gonna, it was, it was pipe, which we, it's an exposition. And she's gonna tell us what it's like. And there's a woman who works in the office and it's Peggy's first day. It's the most cliche thing about the show, honestly, is that part of the pilot. That first part. That, that, that you got Don who was not following any of the rules. Of, of pilots for sure. You don't know shit about him. Yeah. He's he's, he's married in the, bar in the end. The napkin and he's the, talking to strangers that are the, not. Yeah. yeah, there's yeah. ancillary characters that cost money that don't play in the story. <laughs> this is my life. He takes a nap 15 minutes into it. My, <laughs> you know, it's my hero. <laughs> and he is completely unprepared for that meeting. Mm. That would never get past the network. Yeah. Those blank pieces of paper, that flop sweat, even though he saves the day, yeah. not cool. Because he's the hero. Right. What do you mean he didn't have a few notes? He didn't have a thing that he was gonna do that he decides the last minute not to do? No, he's got nothing. What a bullshit artist, I'm like. <laughs> so, the audience loves it. We love bullshit artists in America. But the thing about John and, and that character is when he, because I so believe in him that I, when he, he gives his He's pitch, so and I so can't wait till he comes in and saves the day with this poetic, suddenly this, this repressed sexist man comes <laughs> in with this poetic idea mm -hmm. that saves the day, or he tells Jared Harris, a character I love, the Lane character, yeah. where he tells him to resign, and in the end he says, it's all going to work out, it always does. And I go, wait a minute, is he bullshitting because that's what he does, or does he really believe that? And I never knew that with, with the way John and how he wrote a, the character. But there is something interesting, which John is so, the, the, the actors that I hired, so Christina, yeah. just to say that, so she wasn't even a main character, and as soon as I saw her, she auditioned for Midge, 
and it felt like she was kind of a prostitute when she was playing the Midge character, Don's mistress. Uh -huh. It was a little too much. She sort of seemed a little the art, too... The artsy, the Rosemary yeah, the, DeWitt Yeah, right, Rosemary DeWitt's character. She seemed a little too leisurely or whatever, and a little bit... Um, Christina's not project low class or anything like that, but it seemed a little professional. Mm. And uh, Midge, uh, uh, Rosemary DeWitt seemed more like a, like someone with a, with a, a, a and not village. just that, like someone with an attitude. Yeah. She seemed like an heiress who decided she was gonna fuck for a living, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, am I allowed to say that? That's a great part. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> I got a pitch for you. All right. <laughs> now. Um, and then, so, she came in and did Joan, and I was like, who, it, you know, and I'd already seen her, and I didn't, like, imagine her, she's so sexy, and she's so powerful, and she's a little snide, and I just had this vision, right, right while she was talking, oh, my God, because Elizabeth, I knew, was going to do it. The two of them walking down the hall oh. together is going to be great, and wait a minute, Joan isn't Peggy's friend. Joan's not Peggy's friend at all. I have a conflict. I have someone yeah. for Peggy to, Peggy's not gonna fight with Don the whole show because I still know it was coming. Yeah. It was just casting the pilot. That's just it. I always thought when they were on the same side, oh, they're gonna bond. And then you had this scene where uh, uh, Elizabeth fires Joey because he puts uh, uh, this cartoon. cartoon and uh, they get in the elevator together and I think, oh, she's gonna be grateful. And Christina, because I'm a guy, right. and I suddenly think, well, they're gonna be, and she gives me a point of view as a woman that I, that completely turns my head, where Elizabeth says, I fired him, thinking she's gonna say thank you, and Christina says, all you did was make me seem like an inconsequential secretary and make you seem like a humorless bitch. Yeah. Like you did, you actually just helped yourself, you didn't help me. You didn't help anybody. You didn't help anybody. And I was like, wow, I completely didn't think that was it's gonna happen. It's a little ghetto. It really is. But there, it's the truth. There's so little. I do think it's true. In I hope TV, it's not anymore. In TV, it would have been, anymore. oh, now they're going to have this bonding moment. In TV, moment. they would have moved in together after <laughs> two. That's a spinoff. It yeah, would have spin been doing makeovers <laughs> Joan for Peggy. Joan and Peggy, it's exclamation mark. Yeah, Peggy, you know. In fact, there was, it was not like it wasn't suggested to me, just to have you know. And in fact, one of my favorite things, this sort of meta moment, is that there's a thing where Peggy is trying to get a roommate and Joan get, oh, re rewrites her, rewrites her, her, her personal yeah, ad. Yeah. It's fun sort of, loving, yeah, exactly. No like, dull men. Yeah, there's the TV show. Right there. There's the TV show. Because <laughs> um, they've seen the best of everything. They've seen those yeah. movies. They've seen Far but From But they Heaven. only bond when it's honest, when it's really honest and clean. It's like you, all the thoughtfulness that went into the characters in the story, it never felt false or manipulated. Even when Peggy would come in his office, I'd always be anxious because I... I would expect her to somehow be grateful, or, 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 and then she'd be angry, and I right. would think, why? And then she's, and then I go, well, yeah, of course, that's why she's angry, and, and, and I wouldn't have thought of it before. He's terrifying, and he's paternalistic to her. Their relationship has evolved. I love their relationship. Yeah. Oh, I, I love Me too. their relationship. I love both of them. They're fake, I know, but I love them. I love them. <laughs> They're, they're, good, they're good parts of a lot of people that I know. I've tried to be Don and it's failed miserably. Um, you know, you no, don't want it. No, 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 the one, the one, no, the, his, his, his skill for withholding information and feelings uh, is just str so strategic. I was always saying, like I always I knew it, do that. but I couldn't do it. Like, I was on a conference what? call recently and I thought, I'm not gonna say anything, I'm just gonna be quiet. And by the end of it, I was like, are you fucking kidding me? And, the power <laughs> of not talking. It's amazing and I can't do it. I just me wanna either. be here when I grow Please. up. I know. I'm like, you know, <laughs> I'm not gonna say a word, I'm not gonna say a I word. Know. <laughs> oh, it's terrible, I'm, I know. I'm, ter I'm terrible at it. <laughs> but I mean, so Christine actually was fired by her agent for taking the job. You're kidding. Uh, yeah, because they thought it was such a loser proposition and she had huh. network possibilities and so I will always be grateful to her for her devotion to the project because mm -hmm. I knew it would work. There was an urban legend. I, I didn't know the sure show would work, but I knew she would work. That um, a casting director told me this, and I don't know if it was true, but it was because AMC was kind of the lower of the, in the bottom of the barrel. It was a new, it was a new network. That um, all the uh, actors that networks usually use these uh, interchangeable names and stars and people. That by the time it got to this this pilot, that the casting directors were allowed or had the freedom to cast people they knew were right and they were talented actors that hadn't been given a, a bigger shot before. Is that true? That is, very true. Is so, that so is very true. That is very true. I actually, two things went with it. AMC had no money. Mm -hmm. AMC was nobody. It was everybody's last choice. Uh, ICM was very helpful because I was a client there and they did fund a lot of, of clients there and then they got bought during it and I left as soon as I could. Um, 
they started being, but I took Bob with me. <laughs> Bob was sort of lost in the shuffle and ended up coming to work to be oh. a, a consultant on the show. And his, his relation, he's a show business sensei and one of my good friends. Awesome. Um, but uh, no, I mean, I would go down and like name people and I can name them now. I run into them all the time and I'm like, oh my God, I really thought you could be Rachel Mencken, but they said you wouldn't read. So I, I tied their hands because I, I wanted everybody to audition. Uh -huh. And they're like, some people don't audition. Sam Shepard's not gonna audition. I was like, I get it. But could we have a meeting or something like that? And they're like, no. I can't, and he's can't, too expensive. Yeah. And they wouldn't pay for anybody and I wanted people to audition. But what happened is we had a couple of, 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 of meetings where we talked about actors that we liked. And I kept gravitating towards different people than, than our traditional. Mm. Meanwhile, you know, we go on the air around the same time as Damages, which has Glenn Close in it, mm. and like my mother is watching that. <laughs> so I like get it, and I'm thinking, I'm, I would watch Glenn Close. Oh, she's gonna be on TV, let's see that. <laughs> you know? And you, where, had you seen John before, or was that the? I've never seen John before. Nobody that I really knew would come in to read. Even people that I had relationships with previously, sort of. Uh, or, and they also didn't want to be in it and they would suddenly be available or uh, unavailable or all the bullshit. You know, yeah. I don't want to do TV right now and then they get cast in another show. Yeah. And you know, I don't need to sit here seven years later and like keep score of who was an idiot and who I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bigger person. <laughs> um, uh, and I was, it was, her, it was it, some of it hurt me, you know. But they, AMC was willing to spend money on certain people. And they actually had an, a British actor that they really, really wanted to be Don. And kept sending me stuff, and he was a client of, of Chris Andrews, I think, who, who's my, one of my agents who I, mm -hmm. I trust implicitly, has very good taste. And uh, I was like, Don Draper's big secret is not that he's English. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not, I will never cast a British person to play an American unless they can fool me. Right. And the only person who's ever really fooled me, uh, Damien Lewis is pretty good. Anthony yeah. Lepaglia, I had no idea was Australian. Yeah. But some of these people, you know, I saw a play on Broadway with, where, where it was a brother and sister and the brother was from New Zealand. And I literally wanted to stand up and say, we're, we're not stupid. <laughs> <laughs> we can tell, <laughs> you know? And then I had some criticism this year about the different French accents. So I, I think oh, I'm, I wanted to ask yeah, you about I'm sort Megan. Of, I was sort of a did, lot of trouble. She, I, I, did, I, I'm a hypocrite. Did you always, uh, was uh, that French character and that French direction something in advance or that just happened because of casting? That happened because of casting. I mean, yeah. I wanted, I, I love that Jessica looked like the heroine from, from the mid 60s, um, Thank you. Uh, you know, movies that I love. Yeah. You know, that she was, uh, there's, a, there's a standard of beauty that evolves. Yes. And you can cast, you know, I, 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 I was staying uptown here and I saw the extras walking by for the Nick and you just see these faces and you're like, you know you're walking around them every day and they may, you know, male or female seem, un, 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 yeah. un, they're not our standard of beauty right now and you put them in those clothes and you're like, wow. It's amazing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, really so, cool. so Jessica felt the same way that Joan was sort of felt very 50s to me and Betty definitely felt kind of 40s, honestly. Oh God, uh, yeah. And then, and then uh, you know, um, J Jane Sterling, you know, Jane Siegel, Peyton List felt very much like early 60s sort of. Mm -hmm. And when I saw Jessica, I'm like, this is a French movie star. This is, she's from my Claude Chevrolet oh, heroine. Totally. She's got it all. And uh, I found out that she was French Canadian and I'm like, So you wrote the it. part with I that? I just wrote the part. Mm -hmm. The name, for those of you who have a problem with the fact that you think it's not Canadian, is from the Maison du Pierre Calvé, which is a hotel that uh, is, was made in the Maison of Pierre Calvé in old Montreal, who, even though you're Canadian, he was in Canada about 200 years ago for about 300 years. So he is extremely Canadian. <laughs> and she's named Megan because I got a friend. Cool. Uh, I have questions from the audience that we'd like to share now. Uh, question number one, uh, why did you introduce Diana now? She seems like such a step backwards for Don. Well, um, I think yeah, he, people yeah. never make steps backwards. I know that. <laughs> it's not part of the human condition. Um, <laughs> it's not. It's not. This is a story. How's Don going to save the day with that dead weight? 
He's finally free after Megan to find his ideal woman oh, that he'll be married to forever. Oh God, come on. <laughs> He's going to leave in a in a in a beam of sunlight and end up on another show where there's the <laughs> the, the where he can marry Samantha Stevens. And kill zombies. And kill zombies. <laughs> you know what? Um, <clears throat> I don't want to, I mean, this is sort of puts me on the defensive a little bit. <laughs> Why don't you get your own TV show? <laughs> I am very proud of the fact that we do not do the same thing over and over again. Uh, Every episode is different. And I'm sorry if it made you a little uneasy that Don's doing something you don't like. I'm not introducing a character. It made total sense to me that I'm the same mood. I'm not introducing a character. He, she was exactly in the same mood he was that I was when we, I saw that episode. Gr yeah, grief holds people together. Yep. And you're in grief right now. That's why you're so upset. <laughs> <laughs> Question and, number two. Yes. <laughs> There's a giant poster of Moisha Diane in Stan's bedroom. He <laughs> never talks about him. So what is the significance of it being in Stan's bedroom? Assigned a Jew it. Uh, is Stan Jewish? I'm sorry. Stan is not Jewish. Believe it or not, uh, Moshe Dayan was a cross-cultural hero to America because he was very handsome, had an eye patch, and beat uh, uh, an inc with an incredibly small amount of troops, outmaneuvered a gigantic army. He was an ultimate underdog genius general and uh, was a, a source of great um, interest, a sex symbol. Um, I wouldn't say he's like Che, but he's that kind of person whose poster appears a lot of places. And, you know, not just in Jewish households. But he did live in my bedroom. I had that exact poster when I was growing <laughs> up. And did not know how great he was. Spent most of my time being terrified, wondering if in the middle of the night that patch was going to fall off. <laughs> and I was going to see his decayed eye underneath. <laughs> Have you ever gotten stuck in the development of a character? And if so, which character? And who was the hardest character to unfold? Uh, the hard characters to unfold are the people who come in for like... Short arcs. Yeah, or like even just a scene, like a client. Mm -hmm. Like I don't want to write man one, mm -hmm. or cop number two, or lady. Yeah. And I want, the, I want the casting people to have something to hang their hat on, I want the actor to have that, something to hang their hat on. Yeah. I want the actor to have an attitude it, 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 per, for the minimum. Mm -hmm. I know actors aren't supposed to play attitudes, but you, you want the actor to at least have a point of view. Well, and so try, you can't just like hope a guy comes in who looks interesting and it'll make it look good. So you always want to give them some personality. You, cre you succeeded because um, oh. I, I think of uh, the arrangements. Yeah. And there's a scene, it's an episode about fathers in a strange way. And um, uh, Don has to meet with um, a frat boy, a rich spoiled brat frat boy who has a million dollars, who's <laughs> hiring the agency because he believes High Lies is, is going to replace baseball. <laughs> and... Um, Don, in his integrity, says this is uh, not dignified that we're taking money from this ridiculous idea. This guy's a brat and he's, it's ridiculous. We should uh, not do it because his father is a friend of Robert Morse. So they go to the father. Only time I ever saw this character. Yeah. And but... this character has a line that I'll never forget. It's one of the best little written. And um, they say to him, I assume you don't want us to do this. And he says, no, you should. Because my son's going to probably go someplace else to some other place and do it. And maybe if he loses all the money we gave him, um, he'll be face down on the sidewalk and he'll face reality. And then he has this line where he says, we put all this money away for him when he was born. At the time, we didn't know the kind of person we were making. Thank you. Okay, just one more thing. That was you, you, you realize if you write a good scene, you can get somebody amazing to come in. And that actor, David Selby, who was, uh, who was a very, he yeah. played Abraham Lincoln, all of that, you can get that guy to come in oh. and do one scene for you. It's oh, like I got gold. Oh, yeah. That amazing. So that's why you want it. But those are hard things to do. Um, let's see. If you could go back to the beginning of Mad Men, would you do anything differently? Emma from the UK. Uh... Gosh, I, I'm, I'm terrible at this kind of question. Okay. I, 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 I yes, everything. I mean. uh. <laughs> everything. Um, if you could grab coffee with any character in 2015 and catch up with, who would it be and why? Oh. 
So assuming that if they're alive. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 uh, uh. <laughs> I would like, I, I, I think that the character that I would most like to, to see as an old lady is Trudy Campbell. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Why? <laughs> there's just something, uh, uh, there's something about her that I just know she's going to be like a dynamite old lady. <laughs> she is. She's just going to be like, she's, she, we've watched her get wiser. Yeah. And people who have strong feelings, and she's got that thing that spoiled brats sometimes have, which is an incredible level of confidence that allows them to be open. She's opinionated, but she's always stood up for herself. Mm. And she's yeah. kind of, to me, in many ways, like she's like a great wife. I can't believe he messed that up. And I just like, I, I think, I mean, I, 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 the other people I sort of have ideas about, you know, I mean, Joan, yeah, everybody's Joan mom, everybody's two, mom right? has a friend like Joan. You've met Joan oh, yeah. in 2015. Oh, yeah. She's like, she was so hot, believe me, when she was yes. young. Men would not leave her alone. <laughs> and she's always still very, you know, like vain. And she's just kind of like, you know, um, <laughs> flirting with you, even though it's probably inappropriate. And, and uh, Peggy, I, 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 you know, I've worked for Peggy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I've worked for Peggy. I know that woman. And I, uh, that's, that's, the, that's the boss that, that, you, that when you see the crack, you actually don't want to see it. You're like, away. what? Yeah. yeah. You're like, you're vulnerable? No. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess that's it. I, I don't know why, but uh, Trudy, yeah. Trudy's to me is like kind of like, I'd like to like to see what she did with that's the rest of her life. That's yeah. interesting. I, I just wanted to ask anyone know. here: Do you all do you all remember the episode called The Suitcase? I was telling him before we came on. That's one of my favorite. Matthew wrote that on his own, and and it's one of my favorite episodes where it's just Don and Peggy. And I remember after uh, seeing it, I felt like I'd gone to the theater that I had seen some great play. Uh, and the two of them give such beautiful performances in that. Um, I just wanted to ask oh, anyone else. Oh, thanks. Is that is um, what we call a filler episode. What do you mean? Well, uh, there's always this, you know, thing that, that oh, they're they're treading water while they figure out while they wait for the story to engage. They don't have enough things, and that was actually. Are you kidding? That was actually what that was. <laughs> yeah, but he was waiting for. He didn't want to call because he knew Anna was dead. And oh it was no, it had a plot. It. It was... They're the best episodes. It has a plot. It's just not serving much of the arc of the season. And there are people, he, see, here's the thing. I don't know if anybody knows this, but I don't think I really understand what a plot is. <laughs> I don't know what works. I know what I like in a story. Yeah. I love, like, you know, I like people having problems they can't solve. Mm. And, and, you know, and what the repercussions of that problem being solved, of not being solved. And I think a plot to most people is the problem actually being solved. And then you need a bigger problem next week because you're a plot junkie and you got to have a, it's not enough. And like, well, they solved that problem. I don't want to see them solve that problem. Again. I want to see no. them solve a bigger problem. And suddenly you've got to like, you know, figure out a way to extinguish the sun. <laughs> and uh, because it's pretty hot <laughs> and it's moving towards us. <laughs> so, so I work in the realm of the plots that I live in, which yeah. is, you know, we're, we're, we're out of, you know, we're out of, what, what the boss is coming over for dinner. Like the old fashioned, like, yes. boss is coming over for dinner. We don't have any food. Well, we're going to make some food. He's allergic to that. That kind of shit. That's my idea of a plot. <laughs> or, you know, I always use this example, and I use this for the writers, too. I'm like, on the show, and a t normal TV show, a guy meets a beautiful girl at a party, and they sort of pass chips in the night, and he gets her phone number, and he loses it. And then on a TV show, he will, like, track down her friend and do this and then go to the go to the phone company and like mm. find out her neighbor and like what what was her car and he'll get at the end they'll be in bed together on mad men he will never see her again no that's my that's idea what of I a love. plot that's my idea of a plot so so something like you know the suitcase don had already hit rock bottom I guess Anna hadn't died, but she was, we knew he she knew was, it was sick. He knew it was going to happen. He, wouldn't he make did. The phone call. Well, I love the story. He had a message know. to call, and that's yeah. why he wouldn't call. That's why he wanted to stay in the office all night and, and he work. Tra and trap his employees. Yeah. I've and, been and on you both started sides with of that. the Cassius Clay, Sonny Liston fight. And then that came he, from the writer's room. And then he has a physical fight with Phillips, yeah. um, uh, which she has to break up. But their relationship throughout that, the course of that episode was just so beautiful. It was a harvest. And oh. I think that whether you realize it or not, that's what's going on on the show right now. That's what Diana's about. This is a harvest of like 
themes and emotions and realities that have been established in the show that of who these people are. And now it's time to actually go and reap them mm. and see what is permanent and what isn't. Mm -mm. And, you know, I said I'm always trying to do different episodes every week. The, the most you're, you're, you're stuck in a cliche no matter what when you have to do an ending of your series. That's mm. just a kind of show That's that kind of I've never done. Yeah. So, well, anyway. we're not, we're gonna, yeah. Uh, did you ever react or change things out of the writing infrastructure based on audience or media reactions to an episode? In other words, do you, do you pay attention to that stuff? Uh, I would, I, I will never answer that. Okay. Um, uh, the audience loves when Don succeeds. Hi, Matt. The audience Hi. loves when Don succeeds. I feel like Andy Cohen all of a sudden. <laughs> Uh, hi, Matt. Uh, the audience loves when Don succeeds. Hot, it's toasted. Can you talk about showing so many of his professional failures? Um, I write the clients and I write Don. So whether Don succeeds or not is the part of the story. Mm -hmm. And there is some perception, I think, that uh, where, where people are always, like I said, they're always trying to sort of generalize about it. Look, you know what? All of this criticism I'm making about how people perceive the show, can we just step back for a second and say that I love that people care. I don't care if you fight. I don't care if you totally misunderstood everything that I said. If you're getting anything out of it and I've communicated badly or you get something that I didn't intend or I've accidentally pulled my pants down and I don't know it, <laughs> I love it. I love all of that conversation about it. to have people as interested in these people as possible. And, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, negative vibes out there about melodrama and soap opera and so forth. And all I can tell you, it is the lifeblood of entertainment. It is reflective of, our, of, of, of how we live. It is it was why you get an education so you can understand stuff. It's, it's, it, it's the rich part of whatever part of entertainment it is. And it makes you feel less alone. So that said, what was the question? <laughs> I don't know, but that sounded like the great way to end the end <laughs> discussion. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it, it, what was it again? It was, um, uh, j uh, uh, how, can you talk about showing so many of his professional failures? Oh, sometimes it's not going well, uh, and sometimes it is. And, and <laughs> I, I, advertising for me is a way of telling a story about Don, as is Megan, as is Diana, as is Betty Draper. All these people, they have their own reasons for doing things, but a lot of them are to explain things about Don. Mm. Don is my main character. He's your spy. Yeah, so when you see how he reacts and what he wants, that, 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 that thing is not an object. He's not like chasing after a hubcap. It's telling you, because this is a guy who doesn't tell anybody shit, mm. right? We started talking about the pilot. Yeah. That was the thing that they said to me that I thought was wise, and, and, I, and I was arrogant in my answer because I was terrified, because you can't get caught saying, I don't know. You can eventually. That's what I would change him at the beginning. I would say I don't know a lot more because um, I didn't. <laughs> but um, they were like, who's his Melfi? Who's, doctor, who's his Dr. Melfi? And on the one hand, it's not stupid to say, like, how are we going to know what's on this person's mind? And I was toying with, like, maybe as a bartender. And I know that he talks to strangers. He loves strangers. Mm -hmm. it's, it's part of being an advertising is that you love winning over strangers. That's and what advertising is. we're often most is. intimate with strangers. We Absolutely. tell them everything because we'll never Absolutely. see them again. I was on a train to Boston yesterday and the woman tried out all her baby names on me. <laughs> She's like, I can't tell anybody because they're judgmental and, and they'll change my mind. I don't know you. What do you think of, what do you think of River? <laughs> And I was like, well, we don't know each other, so I'm going to say I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> she had way better names. Than if she uses that, it's her problem. Um, <laughs> but um, I was like, this is what this generation's about. And I think we're still like this a little bit. Oh, God, yeah. We just, we don't, I was like, this guy doesn't talk to anybody. He doesn't share anything. And there's kind of a tool that you use, and it's a trick, and it's gonna, gonna ruin the show for you on some level, probably. But I love it because I used to see it in great movies, like Billy Wilder movies and so forth, where you find out who the character is because someone comes in and says, you're this and this and this and this and this. And they either say, no, I'm not, or they say, so what? Because no one's gonna come in and say who they are. They don't know. Mm. It's boring, and it's exposition. Mm -hmm. And so, to me, 
we have scripts still where Don has, you know, one tenth of lines of other people. Mm. But in his action, you can see it. Yeah. When Don says, you know, I had a bad day. I had a worse day than you. Yeah. And she's like, you've never had a worse day than me. All of a sudden you're like, what was he thinking? What is he looking for? I was upset when, uh, I forget the character's name, came in after he was fired and last week or the week before and said, uh, you're nothing but a good looking guy. You've always been just something. I was like, no, he's not. Mathis. Dan, no, no. <laughs> Don is more than that. It's not, it's not just about his looks. The painful one. I was very upset about that. When Cutler, in the, fin the mid season finale last time, when Cutler said to him, you're a bully and a drunk, a football player in a suit. I was sitting there going like, wow, he's really mean. He's mean. <laughs> he's really mean. I know. He really sees right through Don. <laughs> and you know, don't do that to Don. Don't I do love that. Don. I, I hope the world knows that. Yeah. I love him. Oh no, we get that. I'm not torturing him. He's very I, human. I, I mean, want him to find happiness. And, um, but in his own words, he said, you know, in another episode where he says, what is happiness? Happiness is just something that lasts until you need more happiness. That it's just, right. there's never, it's, what is, it's kind of a dumb. What do you think it is? Um, I don't know if that's the purpose of why we're here. I think, uh, <laughs> <laughs> on Earth? honest, yeah. I think yeah, it's a I very highfalutin, right. I mean, ha happiness, like being in love, like being hot, it's just, there, there are these great moments. And you have them, and then they leave, and then life happens. And but to this whole idea of pursuit of happiness, and you're somehow it's so uh, MGM. It, I mean, it just doesn't doesn't mean anything. Right. I think we're here to evolve, and um, sometimes that means being happy. Sometimes that means suffering. Uh, and uh, but it's about growth. It feels, and like right. you do with characters in a in a TV series. I think you're absolutely right, and it's funny because. Um, just to talk about you for a second, uh, which I, if you don't mind. Uh, um, the Fisher King, which is obviously a lot about mental illness, this week. which you, which you should, you never, you should never appear in public without letting everybody know that you wrote that on spec. Okay, I wrote that on spec. That that means there was nobody involved. That means that he wanted to be a writer, and he did that at home or in Star, whatever no, it would be home, known as. No, at home, my Starbucks. wife was supporting us, and the only reason I finished it is because my wife told me to, because uh, she would work, she'd come home and make dinner. Uh, I'd be writing all day. She'd come and do. I would do the dishes while she was write, reading in another room because I couldn't be in the same room with her when she was reading it. And she would come in, and I remember her standing in the doorway going, "You have to finish this. There's something here." I went, "Really?" I'm like, "So yeah, same thing." Okay, that's amazing. But there is a lot about happiness in that, about what is real happiness, about happiness coming to different people, about ha about isolation. Mm -hmm. And I always think, especially in New York, and. It wasn't as bad as it is. It's getting bad again in terms of like our, our disregard for, for the mentally ill in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why. We just don't want to see them. We don't want to pay for them. No well, they one wants to. Oh, close all the institutions too. Yeah, well, I, yeah. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm from California, the land of Reagan. I mean, you know, yeah. it's, they, there's no, no tolerance for it. But I always think about that, those extremes. And you have a regular character in there who's kind of a misanthrope and Jeff Bridges' character. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes the purpose of our work, I think, or what that did for me, because I was, you know, I saw that in the theater when I was struggling to be a writer. Hmm. I saw it in film school. I was like my first year of film school. Wow. And it was very inspiring. There were a couple of good movies that year. It was not a great time for movies, actually. It was not, it, that was like really stood out as an amazing movie and different and like real. And I love Terry Gilliam. Um, but I remember thinking like, okay, this is here to let me, conflict is about problems. And there's gonna be some unhappiness here and there's gonna be some unsolvable problems. And I am gonna get upset and I'm gonna feel better afterwards. That whole equation was illuminated by watching that movie because oh, it was you. contemporary thank also. You. Yeah. It's not, I'm not watching an old movie and saying like, how does this work? I could see exactly what it was doing for me. And so I think you're an expert on happiness and you're ex in your expertise in, on unhappiness. <laughs> and I think that's our job. I think it is. And you know, it's, it's uh, I, I, my only other question for you is how do you have more than one success? Um, I don't know. Uh, it's puzzling, right? I haven't feel, I, you I have. still haven't, I still haven't, I still don't feel like I've done any, I, <laughs> you know, you don't like you've had any success. I, Good, I, then, I'm, I, I'm, then I'm set. I still, uh, <laughs>
I still feel like I haven't done uh, the writing that I, I, uh, I can do, that I know I, I'm just at a turning point now. Of, uh, of, really? Yeah, trying to go back to original work and trying to figure out what my voice is that I've, uh, I got lost a little bit along the way. I raised a family, I, I made a great living, but I feel a little lost. And now I'm, I kind of stopped now and I'm trying to figure out what it is I really want to write. I still don't feel like I've done the right the, the thing yet. Really? Yeah, which I think is cool because I, I. That's great. It, it helps me to die, wake up in the morning. die thinking that. Don't write about Napoleon. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm telling you, it's everybody's last project. Oh, no, no. <laughs> That's why I made that joke. That's why I made that joke. Larry <laughs> Gelbart was working on it, Stanley Kubrick. Really? Why? Because there's something about when you get old that there's something about Napoleon? reflecting on your life. Yes, there's this conquering thing. That's why Grandpa Gene was reading the Roman Empire. There's something about, <laughs> there's something about, about, about making a mark, you know? Huh. There's something, there's a, I can't remember the writer, the guy who wrote that book, I think it's called A Man in Full, maybe? He's an Austrian guy, he wrote one book and he wrote it over and over and over again. It's pretty amazing. I've read like four pages of it, but I'm gonna talk like I have. <laughs> but basically his thing is he talks about the immortality project. And it's the old thing that men can't have babies, so they're gonna do something to live forever, mm -hmm. like your kids aren't yours. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that uh, that's the Napoleon thing. Don't do that. No, I have no interest. I have no interest. Um, well, I, we're a minute over, so I, oh, I just want to thank you so much. Thank for, you. For, like, thank you for the why. Thank you all very much. This, this was a ball. It was great. <laughs> and, thank you.